Foundation. Dr. LaSala is Associate Professor of Medicine, Division of Cardiology, University of Connecticut Health Center, and Senior Attending Physician, Hartford Hospital. Good morning, Dr. LaSala. Good morning, Henry. I know that we have a uh, number of questions about terminology. People love acronyms. Would you remind me what PMI stands for, please? The PMI in, in, uh, in medical terms stands for point of maximum impulse. The point of maximum impulse is probably uh, generated either by the rotation of the entire heart or an intraventricular event that pushes the apex out during isovolumic contraction. I, I happen to feel that it's the latter that generates the point of maximum impulse. Thank you. I noticed that you've got a stethoscope that looks different from the conventional one. And this, for those who aren't familiar, is the ordinary two-headed Littmann cardiology with a diaphragm for high-frequency sound and a bell, which when opposed lightly to the skin, produces low-frequency sound, but when pressed tightly, makes the skin into a diaphragm, obliterates or diminishes low-frequency sound, and transmits high-frequency sound. Could you comment on your instrument, the difference between it and this, and what you'd recommend for the user? Okay. Uh, the basic premise of a good stethoscope is one that you feel comfortable with, one that is comfortable and fits, fits well, uh, is not too tight in the ears, uh, should not be longer than uh, 18 to 20 inches, uh, should be cleaned, should be free of uh, dust and wax, and should basically have a diaphragm, as we see here, and a bell. Uh, other than that, it's, it's uh, creature preference. Uh, what I have here is an electronic stethoscope that tends to amplify low and high frequency sounds that can be regulated as far as volume and filtering out or filtering in low and high frequency sounds, which is, which is a benefit. And uh, I'm, I'm fortunate that as long as I have an electronic stethoscope, I'm, I seem to be always able to hear more than what my residents can hear. I would venture that that also has to do with something about the part between the earpieces of the stethoscope. At morning report, constantly I will hear the refrain, the jugular pressure is not elevated. When I go to the bedside, the jugular vein is not visible either because the patient is thick-necked or because it's been obliterated in the past. And when I inquire more closely, the response is, well, I don't know if it's not elevated. I don't see an elevated vein. There's been more written and agonized about central venous pressure in the jugular veins than perhaps any other part of the exam except pulsus paradoxus, which I won't tackle today. Do you have a way of trying to unknot the jugular vein and get at the central venous pressure? Yes. Um, I have, uh, in my examination, come up with a, uh, a comparable examination that gives you the, the information that we're looking for whether or not the right atrial or central pressure is elevated or normal. I'd love to see it. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Smith. I'm Dr. LaSala. Hello. We've already taken a history from you, and now I'm going to examine you. Okay. I'm going to take your blood pressure first on your right arm. All right. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling fine. Good. Thank you. Okay, very good. I get 115 over 70 on that side. Let me check the other side. Okay. It's a little bit lower on this side, but it's still normal, 112 over 70. That's excellent blood pressure. Good. And you have two pulses in your wrists, and I can feel both of them, and they seem to be normal. This is the radial pulse, and this is the ulnar pulse. And you have a brachial pulse right here, and I can feel that quite good. And I'm going to assess the same pulses on this side to make sure that they're, they feel equal to me. 
one of the difficult things I have is to assess jugular distension. And I have found uh, another way to assess uh, jugular distension. And um, we do that by having the patient either sitting or standing or lying down. It really doesn't matter. You extend the arm. And you want to be sure that there's no restriction of blood flow down the entire arm. There wouldn't be a bandage or a constriction here. So make sure there's no constriction of blood flow. And what you do is you have the patient hold your hand like this and acting and having your hand act as a tourniquet, you allow the dorsal veins of the hand to engorge. Sometimes, sometimes by lowering the hand, we'll allow those veins to engorge. Sometimes it takes a few seconds, but there we are. If we bring the arm straight out and parallel with the floor, what we'll be able to demonstrate is whether or not the 10 to 20 cc's of blood that are being prevented from draining into the right atrium can flow freely into the right atrium once I remove the tourniquet or my, my left hand. If Mr. Smith's uh, central venous pressure is elevated, the dorsal veins of his hand will not collapse when I let go of the tourniquet. So let's do that. The veins are well distended. They're easily seen. I'm going to try to bring the arm parallel to the, to the floor, give it a small elevation for gravity. And then while I'm watching the dorsal vein release the left hand or the tourniquet, and I see that immediately the dorsal veins collapse, telling me that the central venous pressure is not high. It certainly could be normal. It certainly could be low. If the central venous pressure was high, the veins would, would not distend, would not distend, would not collapse until gravity was over, was able to overcome the pressure in the, in the right, right atrium. And this can be done sitting, standing, lying down without any need to evaluate the, uh, the neck veins. Okay, what I'm doing now is trying to feel the upstroke of the carotid pulse, which have a quick upstroke and I should feel what we call a dichrotic impulse just as the carotid, imp the carotid pulse goes down. And that's normal. Now I'm going to check on this side. Now can you lie back? I'm going to start by examining your feet and this is the dorsalis pedis that I'm palpating and it's quite normal. I notice that you have good hair growth on your lower extremities and there's no, there's no swelling. I'm going to feel your pulse and your groin. This is the femoral artery. I'm going to have you relax your stomach as I press in. I'm feeling for your aorta. I'm trying to detect whether or not you have an aneurysm. So if you relax your stomach, I'm going to press down firmly and I don't feel any pulsatile masses that would indicate an aortic aneurysm. Good. Now I'm going to auscultate your abdomen and listen for any bruise over the aorta or the femoral arteries. I'm sorry, the, the renal arteries. Okay. There's no bruise there. And there's no bruise there. While I'm examining your abdomen, I'm going to see if your spleen is enlarged or tender and whether or not your liver is palpable. Does that hurt when I press on there? No. No, your liver is not enlarged. Okay. Now, a very important part of the cardiac examination is inspecting the precordium. I need to time the cardiac events with your radial pulse. I'm just going to observe your precordium to see if there's any impulse that I can detect. The normal PMI in about 75% of patients can be detected on inspection and palpation. And in your case, I can feel a very good PMI. And I can feel it 
in the fifth intercostal space, right beneath the nipple or the midclavicular line. And it has a very quick, short-lived quality. It does not last more than about a third of systole. And it's single. I only feel one impulse, which is very important. If the PMI has a double or a triple impulse, that's a, that's a significant abnormality that may indicate that you have a gallop. There are two types of gallops, an S3 and an S4 gallop. An S4 gallop is common in people who have high blood pressure, aortic stenosis, or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. People with ischemic heart disease can have an S4 gallop. An S3 gallop is a more ominous sign and usually indicates a large heart that is failing. The timing of the events are critical. The S3 gallop occurs after the radial pulse and it is generated by the early filling of a very compliant, poorly contracting ventricle. I'm also going to inspect your precordium for any other bulges or movements. I'm going to check the pulmonic area. Enlargement of the pulmonary artery may indicate pulmonary hypertension, and a noticeable impulse can be obtained in that area. The right ventricular chamber is located in the anterior portion of your chest, and by placing my fist on the chest and looking for a light lift or a heave, this would be an abnormality indicating an enlarged right ventricle. The PMI should be well localized to a single spot in the fifth intercostal space, the midclavicular line. If a patient has hypertrophy, the PMI will be in the same spot, but it will be sustained. If a patient has an enlargement of left ventricle, the PMI will be displaced laterally and could be sustained. Now that I've visually inspected your chest and I've palpated for gallops, I'm now going to listen. Listening to a heart should have a basic pattern that should be repeated for each patient so that uh, heart sounds are not missed. I normally start by putting my stethoscope over the PMI so I can hear any gallops that may be present. At the same time, I'm going to feel your radial pulse, and this will help me time the first heart sound. The first heart sound and the radial pulse occur simultaneously. I can hear your first heart sound, and I can hear the second heart sound. The first heart sound should have a louder quality in this apical position. I'm just interested in listening to the first and second heart sounds. I'm now going to gradually move my stethoscope up towards the aortic area, trying to time and to see how closely the first and second heart sounds are together or how different they are. As I reach, as I reach the aortic area, I'm still timing the first heart sound with the radial pulse. I now move over to the pulmonic area, and this is where I concentrate on listening to the splitting of the second heart sound. In normal patients, the splitting of the second heart sound should only be heard in the pulmonic area. The second heart sound splits or becomes wider normally with inspiration and becomes single with expiration. I now go to the tricuspid area and listen for the first and second heart sounds. Okay, now I'm going to examine you for any extra heart sounds. Again, I'm going to stay in the same pattern of going from the apex up to the aorta, pulmonic area, to the tricuspid area. So now I'm not concentrating on the second or first heart sound. I'm, I'm looking for extra heart sounds or murmurs. 
Now that I know where S1 is because of timing with my radial pulse, any murmur between S1 and S2 would be systolic. Moving up to the aortic area, I'm concentrating on sounds between S1 and S2 or between S2 and S1, indicating a diastolic murmur. Now I'm going to be listening for any mid-systolic clicks. These are best heard in the apical area and are usually generated by the mitral valve with mitral valve prolapse. On patients where the heart sounds are difficult to be heard, it may be necessary for the patient to uh, hold his or her breath. Okay. Lastly, I'm going to try to listen for gallops. Again, gallops are best heard over the apex. They are better heard, they are better uh, picked up by visual inspection or palpation. I'll have you take a deep breath, blow it out, and don't breathe. I cannot hear an S4 gallop before S1, and I do not hear an S3 gallop after S2. Breathe. Okay. All right. I'm now going to have you sit up. Very important part of listening to murmurs is having the patient sit up, particularly for murmurs in the aortic area, particularly aortic insufficiency. I'm going to have you take a deep breath, blow it all the way out, and lean forward. Okay. Take a deep breath, blow it all the way out, and stop breathing. Very good. By having you hold your breath and lean forward, I, I allow your heart to fall closer to my stethoscope. And being over the aortic area, I'm better able to hear aortic insufficiency.